M1 Metatron Butthurt Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and um, I've actually just finished watching Metatron's two videos that he's done on M1 recently. Now, there's a few things I've got to say about this, but first up, I'm going to say this is a topic. So, M1, what is M1? It is this, um, I suppose, extreme combat sport, um, sometimes also known as HMB, ICF, Battle of the Nations, this kind of full contact steel medieval-ish armoured combat. And so this is the topic that I have been asked for about three going on four years now to talk about on my channel. And I have avoided it because I realise to a certain degree there's lots of things I can say about it but it, the topic is fraught with pitfalls and difficulties and I believe that Metatron has fallen into a couple of these. <laughs> Sorry right, but um, there are a couple of pitfalls to avoid that and I've kind of always skirted around the topic. So let's have a little look at it and see what I think about the topic. So I think the first thing to say about the whole thing is that misunderstanding abounds. There's misunderstanding about this type of thing, both within the communities of full contact steel armoured combat, whatever we want to call it, and it goes under many names, there's lots of different leagues and different organisations, Battle of the Nations perhaps was the most famous early on, but it seems to have split off into other leagues and tournaments and stuff. Um, M1 is the one that attracted some attention perhaps about a year ago. Scaligram did a video on it, and most recently Metatron did a video on it. Um, and it's also known as HMB or ICF, these various other things. And I think they're different leagues, essentially. But there's um, a lot of misunderstanding about the whole topic. Part of it comes from the people that do that thing. And not all of the people, but some of the people who do that thing. Some of the misunderstanding comes from HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts people. And it has to be said, sometimes there are people that do both. Okay. Um, and then there's also misunderstanding from the general public, the populace who don't necessarily know much about HEMA or um, M1 or whatever we want to call it. And then there's also misunderstanding amongst people who are maybe interested in this general sort of thing, they're interested in medieval history. Maybe people like YouTubers like uh, Metatron who know a bit about all the different things. Um, and, you know, uh, Scalagrim as well. And so there's lots of misunderstanding all coming from different directions and it crosses over and sometimes butts into each other and causes strife and disagreement. So the first thing to point out about, I will call it HMB because I think it's easiest to, easiest to say, the, the first thing to say about HMB or M1 is that it is not HEMA, okay? And this is the point that um, Metatron makes and that some HMB people don't necessarily no, or accept. But there are lots of HMB people who do fully accept this. Now, first of all, what is HMB? Well, it's, it's a modern combat sport and we shouldn't skirt around that fact. Why is it not HEMA? Well, HEMA is a very specific thing. First of all, the purest form of HEMA is studying actual historical fighting treatises. They could be from the 14th century or 15th century or 16th century, all the way up to the 20th century. Um, but they are manuals that are rooted in history that tell you precisely what to do with your weapon in different situations. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what those treatises say about armoured fighting in a minute. Um, but we can absolutely say that HMB is not HEMA because, I would argue, because it's not based in any treaties or manual, but equally there is no attempt to make the fighting representative of historical armoured fighting in any historical document that we know of. Now that's not to say that the weapons and the armour aren't inspired by historical pieces, of course they are. In actual fact, because this whole movement of um, what's essentially an extreme form of reenactment fighting really grew out of Eastern Europe, a lot of the armour that you actually see being worn, um, maybe not so much in England and America, but a lot of the armour that's worn on the continent you see being worn in that, this activity is kind of Russian and Eastern European inspired. So you see um, lamella armour and these sort of um, series of over overlapping plates worn over mail with these sort of what I would say almost Mongolian style helmets that are often worn. 
However, you do see people, see people wearing gamson with mail with coat of plates and what looks more like typical armour for Western Europe as well. Um, so absolutely the armour and the weapons are historically inspired, but the important part to note is that the fighting style, I would argue, is not. And that's why it is not HEMA. It is a different activity, although related. The third point to make, um, and this is really the point on which Metatron focused most strongly in his most latest couple of videos, is that um, what we see in HMB, or this full contact steel combat, absolutely does not represent real fatal war armoured combat. Now I'll clarify a bit on that. In armoured combat, your priority, of course, is to kill or incapacitate the opponent. What that absolutely doesn't involve is just bashing their armour. What it does involve is using the point of your weapon between the gaps of the armour, um, grappling, stabbing in eye holes, armpits, groin, back of knee, all of these gaps, depending on the type of armour. Um, indeed, if we're looking in the age of male before plate comes in, then it could involve giving great big blows straight directly into the male with a sword or an axe or a mace or whatever. But unless we're using things like maces or warhammers, if you're armoured fighting, there is really no great benefit whatsoever to simply chopping at plate armour. Um, and for that reason, as soon as plate armour starts to come along, and even in the later age of predominantly male, we start to see pointy swords and very clearly a bigger dependency on the use of the point to get through or around the armour that's in front of the fighter. So what we see in this style of HMB or full contact steel combat is absolutely not what we see in the treatises, but there's a caveat to add in there. I fully accept that what we see in the treatises is 15th century onwards. By the 15th century, we're dealing with full head to foot plate and predominantly, at least in the treatises, the use of, as far as swords are concerned, the long sword um, and, and then pole arms like the pole axe and the spear. Um, what we see in HMB or the full contact combat is predominantly 14th century, that is a hundred years earlier, even you could say some of it's 13th century. So 13th and 14th century um, armor and weapons, that is sword and shield or two-handed axes, maces, mace with shield, this kind of thing. Um, but, um, so there is a difference in the armoured fighting style you would expect between what you see in the 15th century treatises and the 13th and 14th century styles, where absolutely we do see the use of the one-handed sword and the, uh, and the shield used together um, in that age of plate and mail more um, overtly, visibly mixed. But um, we can say without any shadow of a doubt that the fighting we see in the HMB type or M1 type combats does not look at all like what an actual combat between uh, a, a fatal, a, a lethal combat between armoured people of the 14th century, that isn't what it would have looked like. Um, and so I think Metatron has a completely valid point that it is not right, really, to hoodwink the public and blind the public and say, look, this is how real knights fought on the battlefield. No, it's not. Now, point number four is that actually HMB or M1 Battle of the Nations style fighting does represent something. What it doesn't represent is, as I've said, it doesn't represent lethal or fatal combat of the type that we'd find in skirmishes and on the battlefield. But what it does represent is behord or tournament combat. Now this, for me, is the absolute critical point to make, is that there's too much fixation on uh, HEMA people who go, ah, that's what, not what real armoured combat looks like. Well, first of all, they're basing it on 15th century armoured combat with different weapons, such as the longsword but also they're basing it on lethal or fatal combats. They're not thinking about how a tournament's fought. And actually, what we see in HMB or M1 style combats is closer to the behords that were particularly held in the 14th and 15th centuries. That is, combats à plaisance, not intended to kill, specifically designed for safety, ironically. And there are a lot of parallels between those combats and what we see in M1 or Battle of the Nations type stuff. 
um, we know in some circumstances they didn't allow thrusts or they gave them weapons which didn't have points on. If we look at René d'Anjou's um, combat book or fight book, Book of Tournaments, it shows the use of blunted swords with square tips, with blunt tips. And equally it shows maces made of wood. So they had special weapons that were designed not to hurt the opponents and they even wore special helmets um, called a Kolbentunia helm, is the German name, which is club tournament helm in English, um, which has a great big grill, a bit like a giant fencing mask, um, so that a, a sharp weapon would go straight through it. But the clubs and the blunt swords that they were using would not go through it because they were too broad at the end. So, absolutely, it's totally true that there was a style of combat, particularly, I mean, it goes back into the 12th century actually, but particularly in the 14th and 15th centuries, there was a style of combat which roughly equates to what they're trying to do in, certainly in the one-on-one -on -one fights, and you could say in the melee fights as well, in Battle of the Nations and HMB and M1 and this kind of thing. So, in that sense, it is historically inspired. But I have to, interject at this point with my own slight criticism and that is if what they're intending to do in M1 or Battle of the Nations is recreate the tournament, not war of course, but the tournament of the 14th century for example because that's where most of their armour is based on, if they're intending to represent a tournament of the 14th century then they should indeed use the tournament weapons and rules of the 14th century. One of my criticisms is that they don't. They have made up their own rules um, and there are rules, or at least there are the basis and the, 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 um, the hints at rules that they could be using instead. So for my personal part, I would love to see a HEMA um, outlook on the activity whereby people do the same thing as they're doing but they change the style of fighting and the rules and the ways of winning based on historical sources. I think this would be fantastically interesting and I would be very interested in taking part myself. I own armour and armoured fighting is something that interests me a lot. Something that's worth noting at this point is that actually not all of the swords they used in these types of tournaments were necessarily steel. We famously have an account of swords made of baleen. Baleen is sometimes translated as whalebone. In actual fact, my understanding is it's, um, it's the um, fronds of the whale's mouth that are not technically speaking bone. They might be a type of cartilage. But the end result uh, is used in uh, corsetry, incidentally, uh, baleen. But the end result is something that is not dissimilar to nylon weapons. Now, my argument would be, why have rules where you use blunt steel weapons that are frankly overweight? All of the, um, well, I think there's a tendency to make them a bit lighter these days, but initially, for durability reasons, and perhaps debatably for safety reasons, they made a lot of these um, M1 or Battle of the Nations weapons were made overweight. Perhaps also to help subdue the opponents. Um, but if we made the weapons um, realistic weight, but then didn't make them of steel, if we made them of nylon, for example, that would still be historically inspired, or they could even be, even be wood if you want to be absolutely authentic, or baling. And then you could allow thrusts and all sorts of other things, and you wouldn't have so many safety concerns. I sort of feel like the uh, use of steel to a certain extent, you could say it's supported by René d'Anjou's uh, fight book where steel blood swords are used, but I sort of feel that in the modern use, in the modern sport, the use of steel weapons is partly because that's what reenactors do and a lot of them are reenactors as well, and also partly because they think it looks more hardcore and looks more impressive. Well actually, I'd rather see better fighting or more realistic fighting with safer weapons. And the last point, point number five, is really, do I think that M1, ICF, HMB, Battle of the Nations is worthwhile? Yes. Um, I actually wouldn't tell people to stop doing it at all. If you enjoy doing it, then do it. What the hell? I don't care. If you like unicycling while playing the bagpipes, go and freaking do it. If that's what gives you fun in life, God, life is too short to worry about what other people think, do it, okay? Secondly, I would say, I have actually toyed with the idea of giving it a go myself. Um, it gives you a totally different perspective and view on combat. 
because it means in many situations you're fighting in groups, you're fighting in your armour, you're actually being hit hard, it's exhausting. I have a lot of respect for these guys who are super fit, super strong, amazing stamina, who go out there and take horrible blows. Um, sometimes in armour that wasn't designed to take that type of blows in those places in that frequency, it has to be said. Um, because if so in someone in a real combat, if someone's trying to stab you in the armpits, they're usually not repeatedly bashing you in the head. So it is hardcore and it is tough, and I have a lot of respect for those people who do that. Um, and it has lots of, even from a HEMA perspective, I think it has a lot um, to teach us because those people spend a lot more hours in armour than um, hardly anyone I know in HEMA. So they have a lot of experience of how their armour works, how to optimise their armour, and you know, I have to say that um, the sport has improved the armour available to us because they have had to up their game on the quality of the armour they're making metallurgically, so they're using carbon steel hardened regularly now, so it's now easier for a person like me who wants historically accurate armour, it's easier and cheaper for me to now get a helmet made in Poland that's historically accurate than it was 10 years ago. So that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but purely as an experience and as a training aid, I think it is absolutely worthwhile. So to sum up, I think firstly, misunderstanding abounds. I think a lot of people have a different, uh, a lot of different ideas about what HMB or M1 actually is and what it represents, both people doing it but also, also people who are looking at it from the outside. And we need to get clarity, and I hope this video will help, we need to get clarity on what it is and what it isn't. Number two, it's not really HEMA, although it's almost HEMA. It could be HEMA. At the moment, it's not really based, the fighting at least, isn't really based on, on any historical sources, or um, it's at best historically inspired. Now, it could qualify absolutely to be regarded as HEMA, and I would like to see this happen, if it was based more clearly on actual historical sources um, from tournament books, René d'Anjou's tournament book, for example, um, on actually how to conduct these combats, both melees and one-on-one -on -one fights, or two-on-two -two or whatever, um, and based on the actual rules and equipment of those combats. And I would love to see that happen, and I'd love to take part in it. Three, I think it's a valid point to state and to clarify to people, and even people doing M1 and um, HMB Battle of the Nations should be clear about this, it does not represent what actual combat to the death in armour is like. Because of course the priority when you're defeating an armoured opponent is to bypass the armour in any way you can. Could be grappling, could be, um, could be cutting, half-sorting, cutting bits of the armour off indeed, uh, the straps and such like as we see in Powers Cow, thrusting into gaps, this kind of stuff. Um, so what the type of fighting that we actually see doesn't represent historical armoured fighting to the death. But number four, what it does actually represent most closely is Behord um, or tournament fighting that we see from particularly from the 14th and 15th centuries. So why not use the rules and equipment of that tournament fighting? Because that's actually what it's closest to being a replication of. And fifth, I absolutely think that it is a worthwhile activity. The only thing, the only thing which I get triggered by is when I see people, usually outside of the activity, usually the press and the media, saying this is how medieval knights fought in war. It's not. And that's Metatron's point and issue and reason for him getting triggered, I believe, is that absolutely it does not represent the combat, the fatal combat, of how you would sensibly and historically fight in armour. But what it does represent is tournament fighting in armour. And that's what we really, everybody, people involved with it and HEMA people and everybody outside needs to clarify and help make more clear for the public. So I hope this video has helped clear up a few things uh, for my friend Metatron, but also for people who I know are, and are friends with who are involved in the full contact scene. And maybe it's useful to HEMA people as well to think a little bit about maybe how we could bring this activity into HEMA and use it in some of our armoured training. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy T-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.